committee will come to order. We've had a chance to have an informal couple of minutes uh, together. And uh, now we'll start the formal hearing. Uh, I think you all know the rules. Uh, we'll put all of your statements into the record. Um, and we'll ask you, if you can, to summarize your statement, however you want to handle it, in five minutes. The lights will work, presumably. And we'll also try to live within the five-minute rule. Um, we, w we always want to have some, some meaningful back and forth. So I'll try to act accordingly in terms of our questions and, and answers. Um, this is uh, the first of what will be, I think, a number of hearings on this vital issue, both in the subcommittee and in the full committee. Indeed, there's a full committee hearing that's scheduled uh, in just a few days, right? Thursday. On Thursday. And that hearing will cover a bro broader swath of issues than we will today. But this is all a piece of uh, an important uh, and vital puzzle. In fact, uh, my uh, statement starts off uh, with that uh, strong thought, or at least a thought strongly uh, stated. The world cannot wait as skeptics ignore science and deny the existence and the severe economic, social, and environmental threats of climate change. We can no longer afford to live in such a state of denial. The problem is real, and the time to act is now. The clear fact is that we can and must tackle both the environmental and the economic challenges facing our country and our world today. We need to find a solution to the climate change problem that preserves existing jobs while creating new green jobs. We do not want to pit the job of the steel worker against the job of the solar panel producer. I want to be able, and I think all of us do, to ensure that hardworking Americans are able to compete for both jobs. While some deny the environmental crisis we face, Others seem to deny our current economic crisis and to deem concerns that climate change legislation, if not done properly, would make a bad situation perhaps even worse. I'm basically an internationalist, and I know that globalization is here to stay. Because climate change is an international problem, climate change legislation must have an international component. It simply will not work to take action at home to reduce our own emissions of greenhouse gases while ignoring what is happening in other countries. If we regulate emissions and other nations do not, we run the risk that our environmental objectives will be defeated as polluters and pollution will near, merely migrate from the U.S. to countries with less stringent regulations, also taking U.S. jobs with them. This is the so-called carbon and job leakage problem. Before Congress could pass legislation, I think clearly it must address this fundamental issue. Climate change legislation should not make products manufactured in the U.S. any more competitive or any less competitive than they were before the enactment of that legislation. But let, and I emphasize this, but legislative passivity will not work. We need some positive mechanisms to address these problems. So as I said at the beginning, I hope the hearing will help us to determine what that mechanism might be. Some believe the best way to address the carbon leakage issue is at the border, whether through import fees or permits. Others favor compensating the industries most affected by the increased cost and most vulnerable to international competition, even through either through free emission allowances or tax credits or rebates. Frankly, I think there is much work to be done before we're able to identify the right solution. Whether it's on the table, a combination of proposals on the table, or something yet to be constructed. So I look forward to this hearing. It's, as I said, one in a series of hearings. We're here to learn, are we not? We're here to learn, to inquire, to exchange with you, perhaps to exchange with each other. Uh, but I don't think there's any more important issue uh, today 
uh, that faces uh, this, uh, this uh, particular subcommittee. And so it's my pleasure now to yield to you, Mr. Brady, our ranking member. Mr. Chairman, thank you. You've commented the globe is, is smaller and more interconnected than ever, and I couldn't agree more. In this era of increased globalization, the prosperity of American families is intricately linked to the global market, and therefore America's prosperity is intricately linked to the international competitiveness. Millions of American jobs depend upon international trade. Last year, international trade contributed more to U.S. economic growth than any other factor. Expanded trade cushioned the blow our economy took from the collapse of the housing and credit market. Exports have supported American jobs as domestic demand has declined. So if we seek a return to prosperity, it's not enough to merely buy American. We must sell American, sell American products and services throughout the world. And because of the importance of international trade to our economy, we must pursue policies that enhance the international competitiveness of American workers. One way to do that is to pass expeditiously the three pending free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. These agreements will add billions of dollars to U.S. export and economic growth and support good-paying American jobs. Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to work with you, Chairman Rangel, and the administration to address any concerns about these agreements and bring them to the floor of the House for a vote. And as part of that effort, I would encourage you to schedule a hearing on the three pending trade agreements as soon as possible. The Trade sub Subcommittee has not held a hearing on the free trade agreements in over two years. And in contrast, the Foreign Affairs Committee has already held three hearings on the agreements in this Congress alone. The topic of today's hearing, the impact of climate change legislation on U.S. competitiveness, is another issue that has garnered interest across the Congress. And while there are genuine and legitimate questions surrounding the science of global warming, and I urge Congress to consider them in depth. For the sake of this hearing, we'll focus on the trade implications and impact on American jobs as a result of imposing a cap and trade system. I am very concerned about the impact the hundreds of billions of dollars in new energy taxes included in the President's budget will have on America's international competitiveness. These energy taxes will raise costs for every family and business in America. The EPA has estimated that energy taxes from cap and trade, like those proposed by the President, would damage virtually every sector of the American economy and would be particularly devastating for American manufacturing. The higher cost imposed on American businesses would make them uncompetitive with the imports they compete against here and make American exports uncompetitive in the international market. The President's new energy taxes would create the ultimate in an unlevel playing field that would result in scores, actually millions of Americans, losing their jobs. Energy Secretary Chu recently advocated establishing a carbon tariff against other countries, as have some members of Congress. I have several concerns about these proposals. It appears that these tariffs or other charges on imports would further increase costs on American families and businesses, are unlikely to be effective in limiting the damage to import competing industries, do nothing to assist U.S. exports, and could possibly start a global trade war. As proposed, U.S. trade, trade measures alone would cover only a fraction of global trade in carbon intention goods, have limited impact on overall industrial CO2 emissions, and fail to recognize that global demand will see the most growth in foreign markets in the years ahead. Moreover, trade measures provide little leverage internationally, given that the U.S. accounts for only 10 percent of global demand in the five carbon-intensive industries, the imported share of which accounts for less than 3 percent, according to the recent report leveling the carbon playing field produced jointly by the Peterson Institute for International Economics and the World Resources Institute. These trade barriers also would conflict with longstanding American bipartisan policies in regard to developing countries. Many of the same countries that we provide with access to the U.S. market through our preference programs could be subject to the new tariffs. In effect, we'd be lowering tariffs on one hand and raising them right back up on the other, more than offsetting any preference benefits and leaving workers worse off in these developing countries. Mr. Chairman, these are just some of the reasons why I'm very concerned about the impact of climate change policies on America's international competitiveness. The Ways and Means Committee and this subcommittee in particular must play a key role in this debate. 
And as such, I'm anxious to hear from our witnesses today and to have a frank and honest discussion with you, Mr. Chairman, and other members of the committee, because we must carefully consider the impact of the President's proposed energy taxes on America's international competitiveness. And I yield back. Well, five minutes on the dot, Mr. Brady. You well, set an example. Um, as you can see, this is a lively subject. So let's, uh, let's punch in. I think what, what I'll do is to, to, to just say a word about each of you, and then you'll go down, uh, go down the row. Mr. John McMacken is uh, with the Energy Intensive Manufacturers Working Group on Greenhouse Gas Regulation. Leo Girard is the very distinguished international president of the United Steelworkers of America. Uh, David Hamilton is director of global warming and energy programs for the well-known Sierra Club of this country. Professor Joost Paulin is a professor of, a professor of international law, the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, Geneva, Switzerland. And we said hello, I didn't ask if you came specially for this hearing, but uh, you've come a long way, and so therefore he might give a special welcome to you soon. And Robert E. Clay is the CEO and chairman of the Board of Directors of Pridgen and Clay, Inc., which is in the great state of Michigan. <laughs> so if I can put that plug, and that's the last time I'll do that for, for this hearing. So we'll start, each of you, if you would, Mr. McMakin, if you'll start with yourself and go down uh, for five minutes, and then we'll take over and have some back and forth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brady, members of the subcommittee, it's an honor to be here. The Energy Intensive Manufacturers Working Group on Greenhouse Gas Regulation, on whose behalf I appear today, greatly appreciates this opportunity to testify on this difficult and critical issue. I am Jack McMacken. In addition to being a partner in the law firm of Williams and Jensen, I am a director of Owens, Illinois. OI, the largest glass container manufacturer in the world, is headquartered in Perrysburg, Ohio, and has facilities in 11 states. Our working group was formed early last year for a narrow but important purpose, to engage constructively with other stakeholders and Congress to attempt to solve what is often referred to as the carbon leakage problem, but what is actually, as the Chairman's comments indicated, uh, a problem of the leakage both of carbon and of jobs. Leakage is a problem that primarily affects energy-intensive industries that face foreign competition, the two factors that define our members. Our group is composed of companies in the U.S. industries that are widely and correctly seen as the most vulnerable to leakage ferrous metals, iron and steel, non-ferrous metals, aluminum and copper, cement, glass, including fiberglass, ceramics, chemicals, and paper. The companies include Alcoa, Corning, Dow, Wholesome U.S., New Page Corporation, Nucor, Owens Corning, Owens Illinois, PPG, Rio Tinto, and U.S. Steel. <clears throat> of the several solutions that have been advanced so far to deal with the leakage problem, our group's work has focused exclusively on one, and it is the one solution that focuses on the source, the U.S. factory and its costs, as opposed to the border, which, where, which is where all of the other mechanisms are focused. There are various names for this solution, but we've taken to calling it an output-based rebate, which is the phrase first used to describe one of the prominent and promising versions that featured in the Inslee Doyle Carbon Leakage Prevention Act. Mr. Doggett included a version of this kind of relief in his bill, H.R. 6316, and we are very encouraged to learn that he is considering including in this year's version some of the key features of Inslee Doyle as it has evolved. What is rebated to energy-intensive trade-exposed manufacturers under these proposals is a significant portion of the cost of unilateral regulation, both the direct costs of allowances or of a carbon tax or carbon permit, et cetera, as well as the indirect costs that result from regulation-caused increases in the electricity that we consume. The rebate then relates to, reduces the cost of, all production of all qualifying sectors. It does not rely, that is, uh, only on uh, regulation of imports or exports. My principal goal in appearing today is to commend to you output-based rebates as you construct legislative responses to climate change. 
My written testimony addresses key features of such a provision in some detail. I note that output-based rebates work as well in a carbon tax or other revenue type measure as they do in cap and trade bills and that they can fit well with other forms of relief such as those focused on the borders as Mr. Gerard's excellent testimony explains. Indeed, many of the bills to date have contained um, many of the, more than one of these provisions. The other basic category of relief, as the opening statements indicated, uh, focus on the border. It includes the kind of import measure referred to as border equalization that resulted from the work of the International Brotherhood of Electrical uh, Workers and has appeared in many bills. Uh, and while the IBEW provision, like others operating in a cap and trade context, uh, does not include export rebates, the, the category itself does, and under export re rebates, which as I understand it, are WTO compliant in some contexts, such as VAT taxes, the cost of regulation is rebated to manufacturers of energy intensive products uh, being um, exported. I look forward to discussing with the subcommittee some of the ways in which I see that an export, re that a uh, output based rebate fills in some gaps that otherwise exist in border uh, measures. Finally, I want to, to mention that another characteristic of our group's members is that we have union workforces and that we have worked hard and successfully with our unions over the last several decades, spurred by foreign competition to become, in the main, the most productive producers in the world. It is a pleasure to be sitting on this panel beside Mr. Gerard and to be working alongside our labor colleagues as well as the environmental community to find a solution to this very pressing problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerard. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I said he was really fast. On my watch, he took three and a half minutes, so I hope I can get his minute and a half because I'm not near that fast. Let me, uh, let me thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding uh, this hearing. Uh, as you said, my name is Leo Gerard. I'm the international president of the United Steelworkers Union. We have 850,000 members in North America. And our name uh, actually belies uh, the members we represent. We're the dominant union in the paper sector, in box making, in glass, in ceramics, in cement, in chemicals, aluminums, tire and rubber. We're a important but not dominant union in auto and auto parts. And in obviously we're the dominant union in the steel industry. The one thing all these industries have in common is they're pretty much all energy intensive industries and that uh, they all rely on current science to make the best products they can make. And our concern, and we're here today to express our concern, and let me say that we're not Johnny come lately to the global warming debate. We held our first anti-pollution conferences in the early 1960s. We produced a document in 1990 called Our Children's World, and in 1990 we said that global climate change was going to be the most important issue facing our generation. We reissued a newer paper in 1996 called Securing Our Children's World. Both of those are easily accessible and we'd be happy to provide them to you. And that uh, part of our concern clearly is that we have to address the issue of global warming, but we have to do it in a way that will return America's leadership and reassert our leadership on cutting edge technology. We can only do that if we move forward in a way that creates jobs, does cost us jobs, and that we believe that we can't end up having some kind of a, of a system that doesn't deal with the issue of car carbon leakage. And that system can only be answered if we have a program that doesn't squander through the law of unintended but not unforeseen consequences of having a carbon costing system that doesn't recognize that the issue is called global warming. It's not called Michigan warming or Chicago warming or Pittsburgh warming or Texas warming, it's global warming. So to us, one of the fun fundamental issues if we're gonna be serious about dealing with the issue of global warming is that we have to first and foremost understand that it's a issue that works around trade and that we were, as I said, one of the first unions to support comprehensive climate change. We were one of the first unions to support comprehensive climate change legislation with our support of the Bingham, Bingham, Bingham Inspector Bill we're also founding members of something called the Apollo Alliance that a lot of you have heard about, and we're founding members of the 
Blue Green Alliance with our friends from the Sierra Club. When we formed that alliance, there was Carl Pope and I in a press conference, and no one else showed up. Uh, our alliance has now grown to represent more than four million people from both the environmental and the labor community, which brings us to <coughs> a clear understanding that we have to deal with climate change, and we have to do it in a way that protects jobs and advances the agenda. I will be limited to the five minutes, so while we're still in undertaking the enormous and critical task of crafting climate change legislation, it's very clear to us that Congress must ensure that the desired emissions and the desired emissions reductions are achieved in a structured and responsible way. The legislation must not only strive to reduce emissions to the level of the best science believes it is necessary, but it must also do away in a, in a way that minimizes cost to businesses and consumers as much as possible. It must address the need to provide incentives to build the next generation of clean energy products here in America and need to ensure that domestic importers are unfairly disadvantaged in the global marketplace. Many will say that our economy is based on exports, but I would mind those that say that, that America last year had a $700 billion trade deficit and we've lost close to 4 million jobs to rotten trade deals and we're carrying a $600 billion export of our financial resources as we service a $6 trillion accumulated trade debt. I don't want to stray, but I felt it was important to make that point. That, uh, as I said, we represent uh, energy intensive industries and steel and cement are two examples where the science and the technology do not exist to remove carbon from that process. If you're gonna make steel or you're gonna make cement, you're gonna make carbon. And the reason I raise that is that we just released a study yesterday with the Alliance for American Manufacturing that again uh, is here and we'll be glad to make available to you that points out that for every ton of steel that we produce and the same ton of steel produced in China produces three times as many units of carbon so that if we don't deal with the issue of car carbon leakage and we don't deal with the issue of using the best in current science and we don't deal with the issue of how we can create an environment where those companies that at this point don't have the uh, technology or the science to overcome that, what we will do is cost ourselves both jobs and we'll make the climate worse. In our work with the Sierra Club, we're very, very cognizant that our objective has to be to tackle the issue of global warming and that uh, whether that's the issue of illegal logging done by China so that they can uh, destroy the world's forests that are in fact carbon sinks yet to export their their products to America after not meeting those challenges. Those are huge, huge challenges that we need to take on. Um, I won't spend a lot of time uh, rehashing the issue of carbon leakage. I think we're making it real clear. In industries like steel, glass, chemicals, rubber, and paper, this threat is particularly acute because they are commodity-based industries in which even a small difference in production cost can have a huge effect. Finding a way to mitigate the competitive disadvantage that we would have that would be placed on these industries as an imperative if we are to continue the recovery from the current recession and achieve a goal of stopping and reversing climate change. As I said, this is a global problem. This is a problem that if we try to do it ourselves, we'll end up making the climate circumstances worse and will cost more American jobs. The fact of the matter is that there are a number of vehicles that are being discussed right now and options to combating leakage. We're pleased that there appears to be a growing consensus forming around the idea that something must be done to address this leakage problem in formulating climate change policy. A variety of solutions have been proposed, many of which fall into the broad categories of various allocation schemes. The various proposals to address the leakage issue take different paths to the same goal which is the elimination of cost disadvantage that a carbon costing program will impose on domestic producers. Many of the programs focus on reducing the cost of domestic producers as much as possible, usually accomplish this by providing free allowances or rebates to manufacturers that are at risk of leakage. Previous climate efforts, such as the 2008 Lieberman-Warner Bill, 
have included provisions provisions that reserve a certain percentage of the total universe allowances to be distributed to energy intensive industries free of charge i think that if i run through all of these options i'll actually run out of time the i i'll be happy to save that but i think i think there'll be some questions and mr making was good enough to yield you some time that may be a first by the way let me let me just say that for us this is a very simple issue a we believe that we have to do something about climate change b we have to use the best science available c we have to recognize it's called global climate change d we have to make sure that in doing so we don't create carbon leakage e we have to make absolutely sure that we don't put another nail in the coffin of america's manufacturing sector uh, we view this as a complicated process and uh, we'll certainly be willing to work with anyone and everyone that's willing to help us get to that solution so thanks for your time mr chairman All right, thank you very much mr hamilton if you'll take over thank you very much mr chairman my name is david hamilton and i'm the director of global warming and energy programs at the sierra club and we thank you for this opportunity to address the subcommittee and talk about the critical issue of carbon leakage and how energy intensive uh, export driven companies fit into a carbon control program uh, i think the one thing that we're all going to stress here is that uh, a carbon control program that includes a lot of leakage is is not durable politically it's not going to work it's not you will simply ex export emissions so you don't reach your environmental goal and you lose jobs so you will lose on your economic goals. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to acknowledge you for your work on the May 10th agreement and connecting the, the importance of environment and workers in the context of trade agreements. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, President Girard and the fact that the Sierra Club has been working closely with the steelworkers for many years now and we formed the Blue Green Alliance together uh, we Sierra Club goes back to working on NAFTA and other trade is issues to really try to uh, break through on the importance of environmental considerations in, in the context of trade. Uh, you know, we, I believe that we are standing at a particularly unique and difficult moment in history where we have to look over the landscape of a, of a very difficult economy to solve an incredibly difficult environmental problem in global warming. Uh, every, we believe that there is opportunity with this adversity and that we are headed for, uh, you know, to, to, to turn our ship in the direction of a green economy and new industries and new exports. And uh, that result is a way that we can, in fact, prosper over the long haul while you know, really taking on carbon emissions in, in a way that uh, allows us to live, you know, on the planet for the, the foreseeable future. Um, you know, wha wha whereas leakage is, as I said, leakage is an environmental problem if emissions are simply exported. Uh, any plan that simply moves jobs overseas is, is going to fail. We, we support ambitious targets uh, for reducing carbon emissions 80 percent by 2050. Uh, and any program like that is likely to result in cost increases for energy intensive industries. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that those costs are dealt with in a way that, that doesn't simply uh, make our manufacturing landscape increasingly barren. We believe that the best protection against leakage is a strong global agreement to reduce carbon emissions under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That agreement should include sectoral Subagreements that cover the various in energy intensive industries that could be aligning emissions targets, it could be agreeing to shared standards or harmonizing policies. Uh, we don't believe that we get a global deal unless the U.S. makes a firm commitment to reducing its own emissions. Uh, and until such a global agreement can be reached, there must be a domestic apparatus to make sure that uh, in the short term, between U.S. commitment and a global deal that we don't see the kind of leakage that we're trying to avoid here. Uh, I, uh, a couple, I think we're all going to go over the alternatives a little bit. I'll try to run through what we, you know, some of the advantages and disadvantages there of both financial adjustments and potential border correction mechanisms. Uh, one 
idea under a cap is to give additional free allowances to energy intensive manufacturers to try to mitigate the extra costs that they will be under we believe that this must be structured to reward retention of domestic employment and to reward increased energy efficiency and emissions reduction i think we view free allowances in this context is the same as free allowances in other contexts which is we don't want to see windfall profits because we don't want to see those free allowances ultimately fund the next factory in asia there was discussion of output based rebates this is a very fine tool as described by congressman inslee and doyle and their legislation last year this potentially solves a lot of the problems but it's also potentially very complicated and the information that you need from companies uh... is information they aren't always uh... anxious to be forthcoming with but uh... you know we 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 agree that this is a promising area to to work for and border mechanisms you know people talked about a tax on energy intensive goods that simply would simply be levied at the border for goods coming into this country uh... that the advantage is that it's simple it's doable one thing we're apprehensive about is that you would have to take these industries out from under the cap and then either compensate the emissions they were supposed to get with other uh... other regulated entities under the cap or uh... or um, somehow get emissions out of that sector in, a, in another way and uh... as we talked about the IBEW proposal which is a border adjustment under the cap uh... where companies trying to sell goods into this country would have to buy allowances and present allowances under our carbon cap we believe that all these have the tools to work they have the tools to be WTO compliant um, but again you know we believe that a combination is workable but that fundamentally the key to this problem is a global agreement that has sectoral agreements for specific energy intensive industries and uh, we aren't going to get that deal unless we actually make a commitment in this country and uh, if we move forward and show progress we think that, that the possibility is strong for uh, action in Copenhagen and uh, hope that you will uh, contribute to action in that direction. Thanks very much. Really, thank you very much. Thank you, George. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the subcommittee, I'm very pleased to participate in today's hearing. I understand that your core question today is this. How can the U.S. adopt climate change legislation and limit both carbon and job leakage? What I hope to add to the discussion is how any of this could be done in line with U.S. obligations under the World Trade Organization. Uh, as Mr. Chairman said, I'm Joost Powell, and I'm a professor of international law, uh, formerly at Duke Law School and now in Geneva, Switzerland, and I have worked for the WTO from 96 to 2002. I'm currently also a senior advisor with the law firm of King & Spaulding. Now, my core message to you today is this. First, the WTO allows its members to adopt climate change legislation and to deal with both carbon and job leakage. People should stop using the WTO as an excuse to block climate change legislation. Second, that WTO rules are flexible enough does not mean that tackling carbon and job leakage will be easy. It will not. I would focus on getting the data and economic incentives right on cost effectiveness, on technical and administrative feasibility. And really, WTO rules come in at the edges, not as negative make or break rules, but as positive controls, namely to prevent discrimination and economic protectionism to wasteful practices that would, in any event, not help the environment nor American jobs. Now, let me try to explain my point at its most basic level. First, carbon leakage is an environmental concern. Now, the WTO has an explicit exception that says that the environment trumps trade. So you have the right to tackle carbon leakage for as long as you do so to protect the environment, not to protect U.S. import competing industries. Second, job leakage is a fairness issue. It's about carbon equivalence. American jobs risk shifting overseas if U.S. companies must pay a carbon cost that imports do not have to pay. Now, here the WTO has a principle called national treatment. And this means that the U.S. can impose the national U.S. treatment of products also on like imported products. 
So again, WTO members have the right to impose the carbon cost on domestic products, also on imports. The only prohibition is that you cannot impose a higher cost on imports. You cannot discriminate. The following example should make my point of national treatment clear. If after this hearing I go and buy a few toys to bring home to my children, and these toys happen to be made in China, would you not find it absolutely normal that these toys are first subject to the same US safety regulations as applied to US made toys? And secondly, that when I pay at the counter, I will have to pay the same US sales tax for my Chinese toys that would otherwise apply to US toys. Now, when it comes to climate change legislation and carbon pricing, the same principle applies. Imports can be made subject to the same burden that applies to US products. That's what the WTO says. Now, let me say a few words about the different alternatives available. As most people have said already, clearly the first best solution is to find an international agreement where all major emitters cut their carbon emissions, albeit at a variable scale. We must, however, prepare, and this is not just the US, but also Europe, for the world of second best. Namely, what do we do if countries like China, India, or Brazil do not cut their emissions? Two options are available in my view. First, the US could soften the impact of climate change legislation on its own energy intensive industries. Second, the US could impose whatever burden it imposes on domestic carbon intensive products, also on imports. Now, just a few words on how the WTO would think about this. First, free allowances, you know, soften the impact on US carbon intensive industries can be designed in line with WTO rules. They can be designed so that the WTO does not look at them as subsidies that would somehow distort trade. I do not see a financial contribution. I do not see a benefit. The contribution is not specific and there is very likely no serious prejudice to other WTO members. All of these are conditions for a subsidy to be actionable. Secondly, the second alternative, imposing a burden also on imports, by, for example, uh, obliging imports to buy emission allowances. Again, I'm convinced one can do this, one can design this in line with WTO non-discrimination non principles. You just have to make sure that the same burden applies on imports as is imposed on US products. And you have to make sure that the same burden applies on imports from one country as opposed to imports from another. Very importantly, that does not mean that you have to impose the same burden on all imports. If a country is in a different situation, you can treat it differently. So Europe could come in without uh, credits. Chinese imports, if they do not cut their emissions, may be subject to uh, allowance requirements. So in conclusion, I'm convinced that WTO consistent measures can be designed to address carbon and job leakage. The WTO is a positive control at the edges. It's not a make or break negative force. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, the Director General of WTO is in town. So I think our hearing is, in that respect, uh, very, very timely indeed, very timely, because there's an effort to continue our negotiations, and this issue may well be one that wasn't considered, was it six years ago when I was at Doha? I forget, uh, long ago. Mr. Clay. Thank you, Chairman Levin and Ranking Member Brady and the other members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify. My name is Bob Clay and I'm CEO and Chairman of Fridgeman Clay Incorporated. We manufacture metal parts and assemblies primarily focused on exhaust and chassis systems for the automotive industry. So this is going to be more of a ground level look at uh, this issue. My father started Fridgeman Clay in a converted garage in Grand Rapids, Michigan when he returned from serving in World War II and built the company over the next four decades before he retired. My brother and I bought the company in 1990. In June of 2008, my company employed 700 people in Grand Rapids and over 150 people in Franklin, Indiana. Due to the current economic climate in the automotive industry, we've laid off a combined total of nearly 400 people. While some will return to our, as our industry recovers, many will not. And it's important that Congress not take actions that would further threaten our remaining jobs. I believe that addressing environmental concerns is critical to our future. 
but I'm concerned that while the current climate change proposals are well-intentioned, they risk jeopardizing the 60 years of hard work that went into building our company, and especially the future of our employees and their families. Pridgen & Clay, like many other companies in the automotive industry, depends on our ability to supply our customers internationally. We've thrived because we've followed our customers to other countries, and by doing so, we've created additional jobs in our U.S. facilities. Over eight years ago, we opened a facility in Hungary to supply parts to the European operations of our customers. Last year, we formed a joint venture in Mexico, again, to follow our customers and serve them in markets where their businesses are growing. Some of our exports will necessarily move to our plant in Mexico. However, there's a component of our exports that we can continue to competitively <laughs> manufacture and ship from our U.S. plants. But I fear that a cap and trade system will increase our manufacturing and transportation costs to the point that our remaining export business will be endangered. Our international expansion has never been an effort to produ produce low-cost products in other countries to be exported back to the U.S. In fact, last year we exported roughly $30 million worth of parts from the U.S. to foreign markets. The reality is that if our U.S. operations in Michigan and Indiana are not globally competitive, then it will be difficult to continue to grow in the U.S. Bridgen & Clay is a highly automated, efficient company, but we're also energy intensive. Our primary input is stainless steel, which is an energy intensive product. Our stamping presses have large electric motors, many of our parts are welded, and some are heat treated. Even a slight increase in energy prices could make us vulnerable to competition from abroad. And the fact that a cap and trade system will increase costs for consumers of energy is beyond dispute. If the U.S. is not joined in a cap and trade system by the rest of the world, especially low cost countries like China and India, then more U.S. manufacturing jobs will be lost. That's bad for the U.S. consumers, bad for U.S. workers and their families, and bad for the U.S. economy. Even Secretary, Energy Secretary Chu recently noted that the concern about cap and trade today in today's economic climate is that a lot of money might flow to developing countries in a way that might not be completely politically sellable. Secretary Chu is speaking about a political issue and I don't care about the political aspects of this issue, but I do care very deeply about the jobs of my employees in Michigan and Indiana. And those jobs are very clearly threatened by the cap and trade unless, it is, unless it's universally applied. I also want to discuss the proposal to impose a tariff or carbon tax on imported goods from countries that do not have similar climate change policies. That would seem to make sense, but this type of proposal could actually make things worth, worse for companies such as ours because it would increase the cost of raw materials we use to manufacture our products, costs we typically cannot pass along. Steel accounts for 60% of our cost, and even though we purchase virtually all of our steel domestically, placing a tariff on these imports will increase the price of all steel, imported and domestic, and will compound our problems under a cap and trade system because we'll be paying a higher cost both for energy and our raw materials. This is a formula that will drive manufacturing overseas and limit environmental, environmental benefits of a cap and trade system because emissions will be relocated rather than reduced. We're committed to our employees and to helping Congress and our country work through the current economic crisis. However, our ability to continue to manufacture products in the U.S. is imperiled by policies that increase the cost of energy, transportation and delivery, and raw materials. I ask that you keep in mind the millions of manufacturing jobs lost these past several years and the millions more at stake. Once again, thank you for inviting me to testify and for considering my input on these complex and important matters. Uh, thank you very, very much. So let's go. We have a, a very, very well attended uh, we're all so concerned about this, and you can see by the number of us who are here. Until we got to Mr. Clay, I think there was rather broad agreement, um, perhaps not on the details, but on the need to move, and as we move to be sensitive to uh, the impact on American manufacturing, to find a way 
either through an international agreement or in the lack of an international agreement to find a way to handle it domestically so mr clay i think yours your concern about uh, manufacturing is very widely shared i don't think there's any disagreement on that and i do think what we need to do is to look at your processes in your product and really see if there isn't a way to both both meet the objective of moving on this environmental issue which you acknowledge right I mean, you, you, some witnesses, a few have come here and denied there's such a thing as global warming. You don't deny that. No, I don't. Okay. So the question becomes then, how do we put together action with a sensitivity to um, the, the work that you're doing and your employees? Do you export a lot of what you produce? It would be about 10% of what we produce. Okay, so the vast majority of what you produce, you don't export, you sell here. Correct. So if a system is derived, hi, Jimmy, sorry. If a system is derived so that all of the inputs that you receive from other places are subject to the same structure, that doesn't then place you at a com domestic disadvantage in terms of domestic competition, right? This is in terms of inputs. Not necessarily. So if they're, if, they're all, if they're all treated the same way for every manufacturer in your position, then you're not at a disadvantage in terms of your competition with other manufacturers who compete in the domestic workforce. That's true. There is one concern that I have, though, and, and my concern is not raising our costs as a company, but also not raising the overall cost of the system, because uh, if the over, overall cost is increased, then that will serve a function of driving the uh, businesses overseas, uh, people that we supply, bringing the more, the, the larger assemblies in. But. In terms of your overseas production, do you export any of that back to the U.S.? No, we do not. You don't? No. So what you're saying is that if there is an increase in cost here, it will make it more difficult for you to compete. If you don't bring most of it back, then your competition overseas is under the same rules as yours. We supply companies that make more complex assemblies. If the overall cost of that assembly increases in the United States, I believe there's a good chance that that could move to a different part of the world. But the, the competition there would be under the same rules. If they don't, if they don't have any particular rules relating to, to emissions, and we very much want an international agreement, still the, the, the playing field in terms of your overseas operations are more or less the same as everybody else who's competing in that country who is not bringing the product back to the United States. And, and I'll tell you, I, I, I do this not to challenge you as much as to try to urge that as we talk about this issue, that we're really careful about generalizations and about conclusions, uh, because there is a deep determination here for us to accomplish both, I think, in this institution, at least most of us. We can't stand still on global warming. We also want to maintain the manufacturing base. And so therefore, as we try to put those two things together, we have to really be careful that we disaggregate and not draw conclusions that really are not correct. And if we look at the dynamics of your operations here and overseas, 
it seems to me very feasible that you can accomplish both objectives and including without your moving your operations overseas in order to bring it back here i've used up my five minutes mr brady thank me mr chairman thank you for yielding would like to thank the witnesses for appearing here today and like to especially thank mr clay who's the sole witness in the in the pursuit of what we hope to create which is more american jobs i would point out that america is a very open market we let a lot of countries sell it here but when you try to sell our products around the world we often find it stymied free trade agreements have created two way trade where for example in the where we sell more products and services for example in central america we've turned in our, that trade agreement a one billion dollar deficit into nearly a seven billion dollar trade surplus in just about two years and also point out i think the example of chinese steel is a great example of how complicated this issue is um, uh, if you look closely below the surface um, america relies on many mills electric arc furnaces a lot of recycling uh, china relies on integrated mills with blast and basic on oxygen furnaces because they don't yet have a, a scrap uh, steel uh, sector. We have a temporary advantage uh, at best. And those who think we will leverage China, I think one, China will argue accurately that their per capita CO2 emissions are one third those of the United States. And they, because so little of Chinese steel makes it to America, less than 1% of what they uh, produce, and most likely, after the economy picks up, they'll be returned to a net importer of steel, very unlikely that any trade uh, barriers we erect here or cost will leverage a China into an international agreement. Point being, it will drive up the cost of steel for Mr. Clay, have no impact uh, overseas against competitors. I would like, because it is a complicated issue, I would like to submit for the record uh, this uh, analysis done by the Brookings Institute that uh, seriously questions whether the border measures uh, Mr. Powell describes could be compliant with our WTO obligations. Uh, without objection. Maintaining the competitiveness of U.S. exporters like Mr. Clay and others, critical to promoting economic growth. We can't just buy American, we have to sell American. Last year, the EPA estimated how much energy prices could increase under the Lieberman Warner cap and trade bill a proposal that called for less uh, severe emissions cuts than those outlined in the President's budget. We asked the staff at the U.S. International Trade Commission to model the impact of these very conservative energy price hikes on U.S. exports. Uh, this analysis shows that uh, exports um, of over a half a billion dollars would see a, a decline uh, of U.S. exports of $162 billion included in these sectors are automotive stampings and parts, products produced by workers at Mr. Clay's company. I would like to submit this analysis for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman. If Congress moves hastily to impose risky new cap and trade energy taxes, America stands to lose a stunning $162 billion in export sales. That's a drastic 30% loss of American-made products and services. And despite some proponents' claims that few industries would be affected, this analysis, based on data from the EPA, clearly shows that American exporters in these 52 key economic sectors across the spectrum of manufacturing, agriculture, and services would experience severe losses in exports as a result of higher coal, oil, and natural gas prices, another reason Congress should avoid a rush to legislation that could significantly damage the U.S. economy and threaten the jobs of many hardworking Americans, and I would submit this for the record as well. Without, without objection, it's, uh, it's in the record. Mr. Clay, let's assume the President's new energy tax has become law. Congress imposes new trade restrictions on raw material, like steel, aluminum, and other critical raw materials. You've explained this creates a double whammy because you would have to deal with the energy taxes and your input costs would increase. Let's further assume that China does not follow the U.S. lead, does not impose higher energy taxes on it, its economy, which is likely. In such a scenario, what would be the impact on the competitiveness of your business and your workers? 
could make our business very vulnerable to shipments from overseas and it would be make our volume our workers vulnerable to losing their jobs but i think this is this analysis is key in that it shows that at a time when we have a very fragile economy considering drastic changes that could cut thirty percent of our export sales around the world would have a real impact on businesses like yours not just in manufacturing but in ag and services across the spectrum in america another reason i think it is wise mr chairman to have hearings like this so we can explore all these issues in depth and i would yield back thank you so what we'll do now is follow the rule we'll take people in as they came in mr chair yes here yes i uh I'm, I'm very uncomfortable sitting here and listening to this i uh, wouldn't want this to go much further without clearing up the record i think uh, well, let me suggest this mr chair maybe let me try to follow the rules and my guess is somebody will I'm yield to I'm, you. I'm not that good at the rules but i'll follow them okay <coughs> so um so we'll go with our usual order those who were here at the drop of the gavel will be first and since there are I think nine or ten Democrats and five Republicans will follow the rule two for one. We will not do that when the numbers are basically even. So now Mr. McDermott is next. Mr. Gerard? Yes, sir. That I'll give you two planned, minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry? I'll give you two minutes to clear the record. Th thank you. I, uh, I just want to make sure that Mr. Brady understands that uh, America's steel industry is not a mini mill industry. There's 29 blast furnaces. Currently, only nine are working because of the economic collapse in our sector. I want you to know that uh, the Chinese steel has been being dumped into America in record proportions. And in fact, on one important uh, commodity that you might have some familiarity with, oil country tubular goods, China has put as much steel into our market in the last six months as the whole market can withstand. So I'll give it to you as an example. If there's 5 million tons, China's put 5 million tons into our market. Since our economic collapse in uh, November of 08 to now, China has increased its dumping into our market in almost every commodity. So that it's not that uh, China is uh, uh, being neutral about this. And in fact, what they've done is try to take over our market. Who is and the largest export of steel into America? The, the largest um, export. Canada. And who's you're the using my time. Are you're using my time? Reclaiming my time. That would be the European you're using, Union. You're using my time. Reclaiming my the time. Third you're using my time. I thought we were. You're using my time. And in fact, I want to make sure that you understand you're inaccurate in your information. And, and that if we're going to deal with the issue of climate change, the fact of the matter is that China produces three times the unit of carbon for every ton of steel they produce. And this is called global warming. It's not Chicago warming or Texas warming. It's global warming. And as long as we're making it hospitable, for China to dump their steel into our market, or as long as we're making it hospitable for China to move their steel around the world, we're making the issue of global warming worse, not better. And the fact of the matter is that global warming is a real issue. Our union recognized it in 1990, and in 1990 we said we had to start doing something about it. And we can do that in a way that finds real solutions, not solutions to opening up our market to China so they can keep dumping their unsafe environmentally fraudulent products into our market. And I resent yeah. you uh, pretending that that's not what they're doing. And so for our yeah, members, Mr. I want to make the record real clear. My time. I, 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 I want to uh, open up another issue because obviously the question will ultimately be decided whether or not we do something. The people who don't want to do anything because it's going to create a problem are, are for another day. I want to hear uh, from um, Mr. Powell, how does the United States go to Copenhagen having done nothing? What, explain to me what our position will be, uh, pro and con. I mean, maybe it's better to go with nothing, or maybe it's better to have passed the bill, or give us our position in the world if we don't deal with this, including the, the leakage. People say we can do that under WTO. But tell us what happens at Copenhagen with nothing. Thank you. A as you may know, in Europe, we've been having the very discussion you're having now for years. And
and there the issue was. We had a hiatus of eight years here. Yeah, so, so the, the problem is for, for Europe, the idea there was what do we do with US exports who are not paying the, the price of carbon? Of course, now the situation is changing and US uh, seems willing to do something. Now, it, when it comes to the alternative of going to Copenhagen without anything or having legislation in place, my hope would be that the U.S. would take the lead on this global issue and, and lead by example. And my ultimate hope would be that whatever border measure uh, is in the bill would eventually not have to be used, would not have to be implemented, and that it would act as stick carrot for China, Brazil to come to the table and cut their own emissions. And I, I strongly hope that this will be the case, that we will never have to use the instrument of trade, which is, I admit, uh, that to, to, to Mr. Brady, that it, it is a harsh instrument, that we will never have to use this, but we could use it as a stick in legislation with the hope that an international deal is made. So it is possible that if we do nothing, that the Europeans might decide to impose a border tax or whatever, whatever mechanism you want to call it or what words you want to use and just say anything coming into Europe pays an additional $5 or $10 a the ton European, for coal. The European Commission has made it clear that they are also looking into carbon leakage, job leakage, and they will first identify those industries that will get free allowances allocated, and if the, the problem persists, they will also think about border measures. And yes, that would be China, but also the U.S. if the U.S. is not cutting emissions. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your uh, very constructive comments. Uh, they suggest the challenges that we face in constructing a solution, uh, but they don't take the approach of just excuses for inaction. To those who are concerned about a rush to legislate, uh, as I think the, the last comment just indicated, uh, we've had eight years of the United States being the major obstacle to resolving uh, the climate change issue. And I'm sure it will take the world a little bit of time to adjust to the notion that we are doing a complete turnabout and are now willing to provide some leadership to deal with this critical problem. Uh, I, uh, I'm very pleased that this hearing is focusing on this issue. I don't believe that the Sierra Club and the Steelworkers have been rather very frequent visitors, if, at, if ever, before this subcommittee. And if we are to build a new trade policy that recognizes that we must be concerned with the effect of trade on workers and on the environment. It will be through collaboration, uh, not by focusing all our attention on the leftovers from an outmoded trade policy of the past. Uh, specifically, with reference to climate change and how we move forward, Mr. McMacken, it seemed to me that uh, the industries that you represent, if we get it wrong, uh, they are going to be disadvantaged perhaps more than any other industries in the country because you do rely on energy uh, significantly in your production. And let me just ask you from that perspective, and I believe your testimony is to this effect, but are you convinced that as challenging as it may be to work out the details, that there is a way uh, to maintain a level playing field for American industry, both for importers and exporters? Uh, Mr. Doggett, I think that there is, and as an example of the progress we're making in fashioning that, last year when this subcommittee had a hearing, uh, the, the gap in some of the proposals that uh, was pointed out where it wouldn't help export markets. Since then, um, there are provisions, for instance, I know there's one in Mr. McDermott's um, bill, and I think it's in Mr. Larson's bill, that would aid uh, export markets by providing for export rebates. Your bill, which goes at the fundamental problem uh, by uh, having what amounts to one of our, our, our output-based rebates or allocation grants, would also solve the problem in export markets by removing the extra cost at the source by, in effect, rebating a lot of that cost to the manufacturer. So yes, I think we can get there and we're making good progress. I think this is very helpful testimony to have an international expert on trade laws because among the many excuses, the mythology that those who want to be as inactive in the future as this country has been for the last eight years, 
has been the claim that we cannot do anything to assure the competitiveness of our industry without violating the WTO. And you pointed out constructively in your testimony that the same issues have already been considered in Europe. I think we can learn from the experience of the European countries with cap and trade and on these issues. And in that regard, Mr. Hamilton, I, I appreciate the fact that you were here in this room uh, with the majority of the Democrats on this committee last year when we introduced the Climate Matters Bill uh, 1616 that uh, Mr. McMacken referred to. And uh, uh, is it your belief uh, that we would be better served by seeking uh, a way of addressing these competitiveness issues uh, by uh, focusing on an approach other than just giving away uh, a, a permits to pollute, giving away allowances? Um, Mr. Doggett, as, as I said in my testimony, I believe, as I said in my testimony, I uh, believe that there are ways to kind of combine and structure these alternatives so that that you, there are a couple of different ways you can make it work. I, I think I talked about the, uh, what we saw as a drawback of free allocations, which is you don't know what happens to it necessarily. Uh, if companies are in fact able to raise prices on the perception that they're now under a, a regulatory system, uh, then you run the risk of windfall profits. If they're really trade challenged and, and price constricted, uh, that is much less of a risk. So it really, you know, a, a lot of these things vary industry to industry and, and become, uh, you know, become very tailored. And I think, you know, an output-based rebate is a more tailored instru instrument to deal with that. Uh, but, you know, again, we, we've been talking about mixing and matching and, and there are different strengths to different uh, mechanisms. You also mentioned in your testimony that you thought the essential solution is a global agreement. Uh, but you would agree that to say no action in the United States until others act is just a way of leaving, giving a veto power to the most regressive country that refuses to act. Someone that would, would say adopt the policy the United States has followed for the last eight years. I, you know, I, I really cut out all the bit about science and uh, all the reasons from the melting of the permafrost and the acidification of the oceans and, and all the things that the Sierra Club usually talks about, but we really are in a race against time to effectively address climate change. Uh, you know, I think most, both the IPCC and, and uh, Dr. Hansen and others are, you know, emphasize the fact that we don't have a long time to wait for the stars to be in complete alignment before we do something. And if we're to actually endeavor to lead on the international stage, uh, you know, we have some ground to make up. And, so and as we lead, since my time is running out, as, as we lead, we want to cooperate. We want to avoid ever having to use uh, the trade tools as you testified. But uh, you believe, do you not, Mr. Hamilton, that we need to have as a part of our new cap and trade, cap and invest law provisions that will provide disincentives to countries that do not uh, join us uh, in addressing this problem of carbon pollution. Yes, we believe very clearly that no action to prevent leakage should not be an option. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Doggett. And Mr. Davis, you're next. And the clock did not start. Um, it was totally unintentional when Mr. Doggett. Uh, so, <laughs> Mr. Davis, you'll have an extra 45 seconds, or one of you will. So you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, since we are talking about manufacturing, I have one question here. Just raise your hand. How many of you have actually run a manufacturing business? Who's in this panel today? We have plant manager, Mr. Gerard, of the union. No, I ran the union. Okay, that's not what 850,000 members in two countries. That wasn't uh, what I asked. I'll claim my time. Industries. Thank you. Uh, we are going to operate by our rules while we're here. The, uh, I do find it somewhat ironic when we deal with a manufacturing trade issue that we only have one manufacturing executive here. I grew up around the steel and the coal industry. I understand it having watched the plant closing, and I think the obsession with, you know, with the past eight years is somewhat misguided intellectually when we're talking about generational impacts that go back to the 1950s. Legitimate environmental questions to ask, legitimate trade questions to ask of how we maintain competitiveness of jobs. And I think the, uh, I think the false adversarial nature is uh, uh, a mistake. Our Ohio Valley has four mills. 
Uh, of those four mills, every one of them, including bargaining unit members, have told me that these uh, compliance standards will cause them to probably lose their jobs. You know, as our Democratic floor leader in Kentucky says, what are you going to say to the ca uh, Caterpillar D8 operator in a mine who just had his job legislated away in the coal industry? Uh, that can't be replaced effectively with anything. And millions of jobs depend on trade, 42 percent of jobs in our country. 20 percent of our jobs in Kentucky are dependent on international trade. It's a competitiveness issue with American workers uh, throughout. And I'm concerned about the impact of these energy taxes. This is not an investment. This is a fee. When we talk about an investment, it's where we have the placement, actually, of money into the, uh, uh, into the private sector, and you've got to have that uniform playing field. You know, one thing that I would question is the, the border measures, to me, don't make sense from a simple equilibrium standpoint in commerce. I'm just a simple manufacturing guy by background, trained as an engineer and was in the Army before that. Uh, you know, my, my viewing of chemistry and physics is based on an industrial and a practical level. Uh, and we're not here, as the chairman said, to talk about global warming uh, and the scientific perceptions of that, which there are certainly many viewpoints. Uh, but more important, uh, you know, China is the top CO2 producer in the world, followed by India and Brazil. Per capita is a different ratio, with, uh, but we only consume 1 percent of their production. I mean, it would seem to me on simple metrics, and plenty of uh, uh, economists have seen this, it would be cheaper for them not to comply and pay a tariff for products into the United States knowing that uh, uh, they could stand one-on-one -on -one with that cost. Uh, Mr. McMacken, you've talked about how the Inslee Doyle provision reduces compliance costs faced by some manufacturers. How significant are the cost increases manufacturers would continue to face even under Inslee Doyle provision? Th there, will, uh, there will be some, uh, Congressman. Uh, in, at this point, Inslee Doyle, for instance, would not cover cost increases in our non-fuel inputs like soda ash in the glass, uh, in the glass business. The other category that is left out is uh, the increase, for instance, in natural gas that would be caused by the increase in the demand for natural gas precisely because it's carbon efficient. Those are two areas where some increment of the cost would not be rebated. Just reclaiming my time, so you're saying, but there is going to be a huge impact on competitiveness of our workers, because we've also passed separate legislation to increase tax on American energy production. Assuming that we try to use some of our resources, it would seem to me that uh, that's going to be counterproductive at the end of the day. Congress, of the Congressman, what I'm saying is that it hangs in the balance with respect to energy intensive foreign exposed industries. If we continue to work and design uh, a, a provision that gets us to the point where the costs uh, are, are minimal of unilateral legislation, then I think we can avoid the job loss. Uh, reclaiming my time, uh, Mr. Hamilton, in fact, in his opening statement, said that the 80 percent reduction goals uh, would, in fact, have, uh, have uh, quote, massive increases in energy costs. I mean, I don't see how you can deal with this just from a standpoint of working families the working poor, those on fixed income, to have uh, what under Warner Lieberman was estimated a $1,300 per family unit uh, increase in bottom line energy costs, and how we can offset that uh, and, and remain competitive. But uh, in, in your testimony that you argue that efforts to minimize the impact of the pr president's energy taxes should be limited to five sectors. Now we have analysis that shows that there's dozens of sectors uh, that would be uh, impacted. And I have a question for Mr. Clay. Uh, just in uh, uh, closing, do you believe it's appropriate for your firm to be excluded from any assistance uh, in this? No, I don't think it's appropriate. If there's going to be uh, rebates and assistance for that, then uh, then I think we should be included, but we currently are, are not, to my understanding. Um, I would rather keep the, sim the whole situation more simple and not have to deal with this issue and not have to deal with the rebates either. Okay, thank you. And just reclaiming my time, I think the one thing that uh, Mr. Paulin from uh, uh, Switzerland pointed out is unless everybody plays on this field, looking at the amount of connectedness of the international supply chain, uh, we are going to have a huge consequence for this. And uh, uh, not many of us in this body have walked the floors of a factory and actually uh, had to deal with manufacturing costs, purchasing costs, the integration of products uh, from across the world. And as we continue to explore this, I think it's important that we maintain balance. There are legitimate questions to be asked, but the, the, the thing that I would say in closing is uh, we can't rule out uh, the job impacts on ordinary working people that could be profound in the heartland of the country. Uh, and secondly, Mr. Brady's comments are absolutely correct on the uh, proportions of imports of steel in the United States. Uh, Canada is first, followed by the EU uh, as, as major partners. And when we look at these percentages of consumption, 
uh, let's not create something that we actually can't live with and would legislate more jobs out of the country. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank each of you for being here. And as someone who uh, was involved in manufacturing, buying materials, all of it was steel, selling it to the finished consumer, uh, I know a little bit about what it means, where you buy it, what impact it has. Mr. Gerard, uh, you represent a uh, group of manufacturers whose management uh, has a great awareness of what this will do, I'm sure. And, uh, and it would affect those industries, or I'd, I'd like to know how you think it would, <coughs> because uh, I represent a state that has a major agribusiness sector, a large manufacturing base, and a growing high-tech manufacturing base. Uh, and so taking a close look, let me give you three of those and just ask you if you would to give me, a, give me your thoughts very quickly on it so I can get to another question some of these others. Uh, one of those would be uh, right adjacent to my district, really, the Tar Heel uh, slaughtering plant, the largest pork uh, slaughtering plant in the country, or one of the largest. The other one is one of the largest tire manufacturing plants in federal North Carolina. The third one uh, would be a number of pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities, and they're a little different. Those. I'd be interested in your thinking because I think, given your background, you would have a good understanding of all three of these industries because you have people, represent people involved in it. Th thank you very much. Unfortunately, I don't know very much about slaughtering, but uh, <coughs> let, let me just say that uh, our union has had a position for quite some time that on this issue we need to have a global arrangement and that, uh, as I said in my comments, we represent primarily uh, but not unilateral, or not only, uh, we, but we represent primarily energy-intensive industries. And we actually believe that the right way to that path... And, and these three would be... These three would be. And, the, and the, right, the right path in a global arrangement is to have sectoral uh, agreements for those energy-intensive industries because each one has a different dynamic. And then uh, along the lines of what's already been discussed, we need to have output-based rebates. And th those output output-based rebates need to be backed up with, with trade mechanisms so that if people don't live up to the output-based rate uh, mechanism, there's a trade mechanism to fall back on. And then, and then finally, if none of that works, you have a border adjustment mechanism. And the border adjustment mechanism, as several have said, is the stick that we use to, to bring people into compliance. And what I am extremely concerned about <coughs> is that I'm going to be okay. My kids are probably be okay, but my grandkids aren't. And we can't continue to ignore the issue of global climate change. And I'm, I'm very aggressive about saying that it's not Texas-based climate change, it's not North Carolina, it's not Michigan, it's not Pittsburgh or Chicago. It's global-based climate change. So we need to be the leaders in the global negotiations and we need to set the framework. And the fundamental of that framework has to be that we don't disadvantage our American manufacturing to the expense of those that are already unfairly trading with us. And, and you know, there's no point in me hashing back and forth with our Republican sure. friends, but I'll just remind them that we've got an accumulated trade debt of $6 trillion, and we service it every year by spending about $400 billion servicing that. I'd rather use that on the economy in, in America, and I'd rather use that to solve global warming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. McMackin, I understand that from your approach and your testimony in determining the industry that would receive compensation, whether free admission allowances or through tax credits or rebates, it identifies a certain universe of industries that are both energy intensive and trade sensitive. What about those trade sensitive industries that may be less energy intensive? Uh, I'd be interested in knowing, uh, aren't they susceptible also to imports from uh, unregulated producers and the carbon, carbon leakage that comes uh, with that, I'd be interested in your comments on Congressman, that. Congressman, uh, uh, yes, they may. So it, um, in the proposal- and How we deal with it. Yeah, in the pro proposal we're developing, we have tried in addition to expand the list of industries that would be eligible for the rebate, and we're up now from the eight or 12 that always gets listed to our study identified 45 sub-industries. Then I think we ought to have a provision that says in addition, 
any industry should be able on an individual basis to show that it also is subject to leakage even if as you say it's not quite as energy intensive as others but it's very trade intensive and then it ought to be eligible for some of this cost mitigation as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Now, I think under our procedure, Ms. Sanchez is next. And we'll see if some of our colleagues who were before, here before, come back. If not, we'll go over, but we'll go to your side anyway. Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I, I believe Mr. Larson was here before I was. But he's not on the subject. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and I say that a bit painfully because <laughs> This is because Mr. Larson is a sponsor of some important legislation. <laughs> but yes, yes. We, we, we have a rule and we need to follow them. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to work that out. And, and uh, so why don't you take your turn? I, I will, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you for your, for your, uh, and your I consideration of Mr. Trying Larson. to help a brother out. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Clay, uh, in your written testimony, you expressed some very understandable concerns about the potential pitfalls of imposing a cap-and-trade system um, to combat global warming in what is admittedly a very challenging economy right now. And you predict that U.S. manufacturers may um, relocate offshore if the U.S. puts into place a cap-and-trade system. Uh, and I was just interested in knowing, your company has operations in Hungary and Poland, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, That's and correct. Um, are those operations in Hungary and Poland subject to the cap and trade system that's imposed by the European Union? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, I'm just curious to know because if in fact they're subject to the cap and trade system that um, the European Union uses, and your argument is that cap and trade will threaten the viability of, of manufacturing. I'm wondering how those operations mm -hmm. remain in effect if, if, if they're yeah. following yeah. Well, that we, system. We locate in those areas to supply those areas. Uh, and so it's not an issue of uh, the, same, that the same issue that we have here. Back in, uh, in Michigan, okay. Okay. we uh, have an issue of competing globally and competing yeah. Uh, in, in trying to save our jobs from moving overseas. I understand that. My, my concern is that there sort of seems to have uh, been created this artificial divide uh, between let's not do anything and let's admit that global warming is a problem, but, you know, heaven forbid we should really try to address that with some thoughtful pr proposals because it may hurt mm. our competitiveness. And I don't think there's a single member up here that isn't concerned about job loss and U.S competitiveness in the global economy, but by the same token, I don't think that we can throw our hands up in the air and say that, you know, this is just too difficult to tackle and therefore it's easier just, you know, to do nothing and we'll remain more competitive if we don't have to deal with this. I think, you know, globally we need to really look towards being a leader and working with, um, you know, other countries in terms of bringing the standards up rather than trying to leave, uh, leave the world without standards or, or trying to loosen those standards. Um, Brother Gerard, I was interested um, in your written testimony because you explained some of the potential benefits and pitfalls of out -base, output base, rebates, border adjustments, and hybrid schemes. And then you discussed a scenario um, that would uh, function something similar to a value added tax. I was wondering if you could explain that proposal a little bit more for us. Well, the the, the, pr the process that we're really uh, looking at from our point of view is trying to develop a, a series of options so that as we move into the, the global negotiations that the United States takes the lead and has the kinds of options that I just referred to a minute ago uh, as a, for lack of a better word, a, uh, a ladder of which America will lead on so that at the bottom of that ladder would it be the kind of um, border adjustment mechanism that uh, you just referred to that would be like a value-added tax, and I think the professor would, would agree that that's uh, allowable under the WTO. Uh, professor, do you dispute that assessment? No, that, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So that, that if you create that kind of a ladder, then what we can do with that is, A, deal with the issue of global warming, B, protect American jobs, 
and see force if that's the right terminology other countries to meet the acceptable global standard the one thing that i can tell you that i worry about substantially is that none regulated market in carbon credits will end up creating a bunch of carbon billionaires where i've already seen what on regulated financial markets have done to us so as we move down this path we think having that ladder of options in america leading the way on that can lead us that way and if we end up with what would be the equivalent of value added tax as the the stick as well as some carrots then we believe we can get there and protect american jobs if we try to ignore those options then i think we'll get left behind and if we just say no uh, as some want to do then i think we'll be subject to getting penalized by somebody okay final question which is for all of the panelists and i'd like to see this by show of hands do any of you believe that the status quo is acceptable going forward no takers okay now with the time limit you have the answer yield back the balance of my time thank you thank right now I, I want to be sure what the order is uh, because I, I made a mistake when Ms. Sanchez was not here at the drop of a hat. So it's Mr. Reichert, Ms. Mr. Herger, Mr. Nunez, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Tanner, Mr. Larson, Mr. Kine, Mr. Davis. And if someone who was here at the drop of the gavel comes back, we'll change it. Okay, so we all understand. So, Mr. Reichert, you're next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess I can't uh, help but uh, make a, a comment or two first about sort of the the the, the uh, tone of the this uh, hearing. Uh, I was a law enforcement officer for 33 years, so uh, I feel like I need to bring some peace uh, to to this uh, proceeding. I, I am very encouraged by the chairman's comments about a bipartisan effort. We're all wanting to get answers here, and this is really why we're here. Uh, Mr. Gerard, we, we just, uh, we have, uh, you know, we're all Americans coming at this from a different uh, place and, and trying to find uh, a common ground where we can make America successful. I come from Washington State, the evergreen state, uh, but we also are very dependent on trade. One out of every three jobs in Washington State depends on trade. So both of these uh, issues are very, very important to us. Uh, I don't think you'll find anyone on this panel that's, um, that's ag against uh, know, protecting, creating, promoting American jobs and protecting and, and uh, our environment, reducing uh, uh, harmful emissions. I remember back in 1962 when I was uh, just in the seventh grade, my science teacher took us on a little uh, excursion in a fair in, in the small town of Kent, put us back uh, in the back of a pickup truck wearing gas masks. So uh, that was about air pollution back then. So she was way ahead of her time. And, and uh, so we've been dealing with this. This has happened in the last four years or the last eight years or the last 10 years. This country and the people in it have been dealing with this issue and trying to figure out what to do for a number of years. But we've heard a lot about the United States and we know that we must show some leadership in this, in this uh, international climate change debate. So we want to get to the bottom of what we should be doing. What happens if the United States takes the lead and others don't follow? Uh, that's what we're concerned about. Uh, all of us here are concerned about that, and I know you are too. Should there be an economy-wide safety valve such that if several years into this program, it's clear that China and India are not particip uh, participating, uh, should we reconsider our program? If, uh, if you're putting that to me, I think that uh, uh, clearly already China has proven that it's an unreliable trade partner. Uh, the commitments that they made through PNPR to get into the WTO are the, the ones that they have violated or ignored are too numerous to mention right now. And clearly, I think that the, the latter of, of options that I tried to outline earlier should be readily available, including we've given away to China the most valuable thing that we have, and that's access to our markets. And, and if they're going to play through currency manipulation, through... Uh, lack of already weak environmental laws, lack of enforcement and other we could go through. We presented a report not very long ago where they got $27 billion of aid for the steel industry in, in China, aid that's not available to our steel industry we're told to compete with. Clearly, if they don't meet those standards, uh, we have an option of terminating that agreement. And so I think that the, the greater the carrots and the greater the sticks, the greater the chance 
that america has to bring about the kind of change that's needed in those countries and i appreciate your comments that you're a protectionist as well and want to protect american jobs and that's 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 important that we recognize that and i would be the the first to say that i believe we can do both help clean up the environment over time while we protect american jobs and i and i think that all of us here today believe that we can do both we just have to figure out a way to protect the environment protect american jobs at the same time and all of you in the panel have said that too and and we agree with that we want to see your comment help you you know we do know that if the united states doesn't though get some help and there isn't an international agreement uh, we won't reduce global greenhouse gases. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record a chart that's been prepared by the EPA that shows that global emission levels would continue to climb rapidly if the United States imposes emissions limits, but other major emitters like China and India uh, do not. Mr. McMakin, you have recommended that. Thank you, sir. Uh, you have recommended that the allowance uh, rebate program remain in place until there is a successful international agreement. I'd like to hear from the witnesses. Does a successful international agreement uh, require that China, India, and all major emitting countries uh, reduce their emissions? Are there steps we should take to gain their participation? That's the big question, I think. Um, Congressman, for, for my part, the way we recommend designing the provision, um, the cost mitigation would remain in effect until the cost imposed on other industries, energy intensive, foreign trade uh, intensive goods are the same. And to the extent the difference narrows, perhaps the aid would narrow, but it would stay in effect until there is an, a level playing field. Yeah, ju just, just on that. Chairman, can he respond? I Go ahead. I, I think it. it <laughs> It is realistic to, to expect, though, that there will be a principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. This is something the U.S. has already agreed to as a party to the U.N. Climate Change Convention. The idea being that developing countries will have to uh, commit less than developed countries. So we have to be realistic at that level, that it is a question of comparable actions, not necessarily exactly the same uh, cuts by everyone. But yes, I would think China, India, Brazil, all have to cut as well. Great. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Look at you next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Clay, I was doing a little bit of checking here, and, and I believe the reason that you weren't able to answer uh, Representative Sanchez's question about the impact of the EU cap and trade system on your Hungary and Poland facilities is because you don't face it there. The EU caps don't cap emissions <coughs> on your sector, and since all the allowances are given away for free, that means there's no climate impact and no competitiveness impact. So the EU is not a good example of what the President is proposing. Mr. McMacklin, you have de identified 40 sec sectors of the economy that you think should qualify for free allowances and cap and tax scheme. We have analysis that shows over 50 sectors will experience a decline in exports of at least half a billion dollars each. Many of the companies and workers in these sectors aren't among the 40 you've identified such as car manufacturers, textile products, farm machinery, and specialty crop farmers. What about the workers in these firms? Should Congress ignore the negative impact of, of the President's energy taxes will have on these businesses and their workers? Mr. Herger, I understand. Uh, what our proposal uh, would do is identify those most exposed to leakage and we do it by saying they should presumptively qualify for aid by virtue of meeting thresholds of energy intensiveness and, and foreign competition exposure. But other industries that are also um, exposed to leakage should have the ability to go in and demonstrate that and should also receive cost mitigation uh, assistance, I believe. 
So you would say that would be far more, obviously, than the 40, since they've already identified 50, and most of them are ones that you, you didn't even identify. So therefore, there's undoubtedly many other sectors out there that are going to be damaged pretty seriously that you're not even aware of right now. Congressman, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I know that there is some disagreement in the literature. What we focused on is sort of where the consensus is of the ones that clearly will be exposed to leakage. Okay. And the concern of many of us is that there is so much damage that all this experimental uh, programs that you're proposing would do, much of which is not done in the EU, as is exemplified by Mrs. Sanchez's question that she assumed that this was being affected by Mr. Clay's companies and it wasn't that we really don't have a clue of the damage this is going to do to American workers to the American economy and what how many people are put out of work uh, with what with what we're throwing out here right now uh, we hear a lot about the so-called green jobs that are supposed to replace the millions of jobs that would be lost because of the president's proposed energy taxes. However, the union group Change to Win recently released a report that shows that many of these, quote, green jobs aren't nearly as good as the manufacturing jobs that would be lost. The report also states that, quote, green jobs are not automatically good jobs, close quote. The report also states that to make green jobs good jobs, the government must intervene in the workplace. Can the witnesses tell me how much intervention, government intervention is necessary and how much that er intervention would cost American taxpayers? I've never seen the study you're talking about, so I don't know anything about it. Well, I can certainly make it a, a available to you. I'd love to see it. But anyone want to answer my question? Well, the, the point of the study was to say that... Uh, you are that familiar with the study? Yeah, we, in fact, we, we co-released it with Change to Win. Uh, it, it's basically saying that just because a job is green doesn't mean that it shouldn't have adequate working conditions, adequate wages, and, uh, you know, a quality of work that, that uh, you know, that those it's replacing ha already have. No, I, I think one thing I will say about uh, I, I don't actually know which scenarios from EPA that you are using and that Mr. Brady was using, but I believe there are 11 of them. There are a number of scenarios and uh, as to what the cost will be, but not all of the EPA scenarios depict the kind of manufacturing impact that you're talking about. So Not all of them, but many of them. Well, they, they kind of go, f they have a range from, you know, worst case to uh, plausible case. And I think, you know, what we found and are working with the Energy and Commerce Committee and others is that EPA has not good, done a good job at modeling the positive Im impacts of energy efficiency improvements on the economy in the context of a, a carbon control program. And you know, the best safety valve, the best cost control measure we can work with is lowering energy demand so that prices are going to come down and that all of these impacts are as low as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gerard, the Steelworkers uh, Union, obviously, I think they've, they do a lot of work or have historically done a lot of work when it comes to building nuclear reactors. Historically, it takes a lot of steel to build a nuclear reactor. Sure, it takes a lot of steel and cement and everything else, yeah. So, you know, as we look, if, if the Americans, if they were here in the U.S., we were to develop a policy that went out to build 200 new nuclear reactors across the country, uh, that create a lot of jobs for the steel workers? I think if we create uh, wind farms and solar farms and... Uh, we find other ways to do things. We'll also create a lot of jobs. We have a lot of Fair enough. We, we have a lot of members that work in the nuclear industry, and we don't uh, attempt to pick one industry over the other. I'll just Fair enough. I'll just but what you, would? I'll, but I'll just. We we've just uh, 
as a result of attracting a windmill manufacturer to Pennsylvania. We just created uh, close to 600 jobs in two different plate mills that hadn't been working at all. We call those green jobs. Uh, so we haven't tried to put Are nuclear jobs green jobs? Uh, I'm not sure that they're green jobs. We have the standards that were just referred to. If they're good family supporting jobs and pay decent wages and benefits and have great working if conditions, they'd certainly be considered that way. So what would take more CO2 out of the air? Building 200 nuclear reactors, building solar panels and windmills, or the cap and trade scheme that I, I don't know. I'm not technically qualified to answer that. I don't know that. Well, I think it's I'd, I'd like for you to look into that at some point and get back to the committee as to what. You give as me the what information you're working from. I'll be glad to have our I'll report. be glad to submit you the question just as what I asked. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gerard. You're welcome. M Mr. Uh, Hamilton, the Sierra Club supports uh, regulating animal agriculture. And there's been a lot of proposals put out to that have been across the board, but looking at uh, dollars per cow, dollars per pig, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are you aware that there's some folks that say that there were more American bison roaming the plains 300 years ago than there are cattle in the United States? I'm very sorry. I'm the director of global warming and energy programs, and I, I, I'd be happy to connect but you, you. But you do think that cattle are contributing to global warming? Uh, there are manure management, uh, others, you know, there, there are both methane and carbon emissions from the ag sector, for sure. That, that, you get, that your group wants to regulate? Yeah, I think the reasons that we're talking about regulating animal agriculture are different than the climate change reasons. Uh, well, they all, I mean, I guess the I think you know the argument I'm making here, which is, you know, I would assume that the Sierra Club thinks it's a bad thing that perhaps as many as 100 million bison were wiped off the plains of the United States and, now, and got down to as few as just a few thousand bison. I, I think so. You'd probably like to see tens of millions roaming the plains again? The question really hasn't come up. I'm, so <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't, uh, you know, we, we care about wildlife, we care about uh, pollution, we care right. about... Right, so if we were to bring pollution. back tens of millions of bison, how would we regulate them? Along with the system. <laughs> I, I don't actually, I don't know offhand, I'm sorry. Well, um, and, and you know why I'm asking this is because, uh, you know, if you look at regulating animal agriculture, and at the same time you look at the number of bison that used to roam the plains, uh, you know, to me, it's uh, it's going to be very difficult to regulate animal agriculture, uh, and I would hope that the Sierra Club would look at, you know, what's best for the economy, what's best for American agriculture, uh, and what's best for the environment uh, as we move forward. Uh, traditionally, our concerns about agriculture have focused on water pollution and, uh, uh, you know, basically runoff and other, other things from farms. But I, I am happy to hook you up with the experts in the Sierra Club who deal with that issue. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Nunes, you have a deal. You two will get together. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you gentlemen for your uh, testimony. Uh, I think uh, and hope that this committee can work together on a bipartisan basis to meet the a challenge we face, which is to address uh, the issue of global climate change in a responsible way that does not put our domestic manufacturers at a competitive disadvantage, either with respect to their exports, uh, because what we do here will increase the costs of inputs, especially in energy intensive uh, industries, and make it harder in the export market, and also here in the domestic market with respect to uh, products coming here. I want to just focus for a minute on the domestic market uh, and products uh, coming into the United States. Assuming that we put in place here something that deals with the, provides rebates for companies so we can deal with the export uh, situation. Uh, let's assume, I think we all agree that it would be great if we could have an international regime where everyone was playing by the same rules and then we wouldn't have to worry about figuring out at the border exactly you know, what inputs were put into a particular uh, export coming to the United States. But let's assume that we don't get there right away and that we need to move ahead uh, and at the same time protect domestic manufacturing. 
uh, here's my, my question. Let's take China, for example. Let's say China was exporting uh, steel uh, to the United States. Uh, and we had a, a situation where at the border we're trying to compensate for the additional cost that U.S. manufactured of steel uh, is, is incurring. Uh, would you recommend a system where you sort of figure out the, the average cost of steel from China, or would we, be a, would we be able, based on what you know, to take into account what a particular Chinese manufacturer was doing? Because to the extent that you are able to do that, we could obviously send an incentive for the Chinese manufacturer to be reducing their use of carbon-based fuels. And after all, our objective here, the whole purpose we're talking about here, is to try and reduce global warming, right? It's all one big roof. We're trying to reduce carbon emissions, whether from China or the United States. And if we were able to do that on a company basis, you would be able to essentially send an incentive to manufacturers, regardless of where they were in the world, that wanted to export into the U.S. market to use the least carbon-intensive uh, inputs in their manufacturing. I, my question is, is that, given what you know about the international trade regime, is that a practical thing to do right now, or would it require us to put in place uh, a lot more mechanisms to trace? I'm, this is an open question. but I, I, I think that it's... Uh <coughs> It is a very difficult question if I give you a straight up answer about it. Yeah. China doesn't know how many steel mills China has. Uh, China's steel production in the last eight years went from production that was equal to the production we had in the United States, roughly at about 120 to 125 million tons, that now they're producing close to 500 million tons. As our capacity has been rationalized downward and imports have forced that downward, China's production has grown. And if you just this last week, it came out that China is now, even after this economic global collapse, is now went back and is almost at the same tons produced as it was last year at this time. One of the problems we have is that China doesn't even know where all its steel is produced. So there is a, certainly at this point in time an average, an ability to put an average cost on products because there's a range of products to take oil country tubular goods as an example. We could do that. But then we'd have to dig down deeper to see if those oil country tubular goods are being made with the oldest mills, right. whether they're made in the newest mills. So er, e in even going to the average cost uh, would give us a real step in the right direction. But to say that it would be easy would be disingenuous on my part. It'll be hard. Okay. Uh, Mr. Van Halen, can I just up the ante uh, a little bit in thinking about the uh, domestic producers? Within the provision we've been working on for allocating these free allowances or rebating allowance value, there is an efficiency standard and it is sector average such that there would be a great incentive to try and do better than the average and the ones below would want to catch up and it continually improves as you try and press your advantage or catch up. I think it's one of the real advantages of our provision. It creates that same incentive you're talking about for domestic produ producers. If I, if I could also Thank add, because he's been sitting here all afternoon, is uh, Representative Larson's bill has a, a bill that is economy-wide carbon tax bill. And uh, it's simpler, it's easier to enforce. It has few, fewer WTO complications, and it's, uh, it works similar to a VAT that I think, uh, I think Ms. Sanchez asked me about so that there's all kinds of options available that we can deal with this. If I may just um, add to this, from, from a trade law perspective, what you are saying is absolutely crucial yeah. to allow individual Chinese manufacturers to show that they have em em emitted less than the average. And I have not seen this possibility in any of the bills on the table so far. Right, and that would be WTO compliance. Yes, because the US lost a case involving gasoline standards just on that issue. It gave individual baselines to U.S. refiners, but it only gave an average baseline to foreign refiners. And the WTO was saying this is discrimination. You have to give them at least the option right. to submit individual data. To demonstrate that they right. were. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you all. That would be useful. Then they'd have to come clean with us, too. No, no, that, no it's useful to have this discussion. It's getting late, and there's been so much around me is here, and there are negotiations going on in the WTO. So. What now exists can always be changed. All right, I think the two remaining
most patient the people, Mr. Larson, Mr. Davis, I think, I think he, I thought so. So I, I thought Mr. Davis was here right at the beginning. So Mr. Davis, you're next, and then Mr. Larson, uh, you will, without respect to seniority or other position, you will wrap this up for us. Mr. Davis, it's a pleasure, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for letting uh, two non-subcommittee members uh, make our way to the dance today, and I thank my caucus chairman for not exerting either seniority or rank or privilege, any of those wonderful things. Uh, let me, if I can, pick up on Mr. Doggett's line of questions, and I want to pose this first to you, Mr. Gerard, then invite come out from anyone else on the panel. Uh, Mr. Doggett was raising the concern that if the United States failed to act in a unilateral way in terms of enacting some kind of cap and trade regime or significant carbon emission standards, carbon tax, what have you, um, that that would obviously should not be an excuse, the fact that there's no successor to Kyoto, the fact that there is no prospect of an immediate international regime. Let, let me maybe test that proposition a little bit. Some have raised the concern, which sounds plausible to me, that if the United States were to enact a unilateral regime, that that could actually be a disincentive to China, to India, to other developing countries to create a successor to Kyoto. Would you comment on that, Mr. Gerard? My, uh my, my experience and my instincts would tell me that if we acted unilaterally without the kind of mechanisms we've talked about today, that there would be absolutely no reason for places like China or India to do anything. They, they currently have access to our markets, and they currently violate almost every rule there is. And I think the only way that we can have a meaningful global arrangement is with with the combination of carrots and sticks. I think we need to negotiate globally. I think we need to have sectoral, ex sectoral uh, arrangements that would be done by energy intensive sectors, then I think we need that ladder of tools that I talked about earlier. And I think that way China and India will, will, have, uh, will have to take action. I, I'm very, very sensitive to one of the most valuable things on earth is access to this market. And when we give it away for free, we also give away our jobs. Is there anyone on the panel who has a different point of view on this issue in terms of what the incentive would be for just to single out to the Chinese and the Indians if the U.S. were to go first and to enact a regime? Does anyone think that that would somehow incentivize the Chinese and Indians to come to the table? Mr. Davis, if I could just emphasize that um, it does seem logical to me that if we unilaterally disarm, giving, say, the Chinese a greater cost advantage than they have, they may slow down to enjoy that increased advantage. But, as Mr. Gerard said, if we from the get-go include provisions that deny them that advantage over our trade-exposed uh, industries, we will have denied them the incentive to drag their feet. Does anyone have a different point of view who's on the panel? Uh, I, I would just add that I, I, if you look at the countries that are participating in the Kyoto Agreement and the UN Framework Convention, add them to the U.S. and I believe Australia, and you've got roughly 80 percent of China's exports. So it, I think even if we act, we aren't acting alone because the Framework Convention continues to move forward. And that uh, we, you know, at that point we may need to think about what other measures are necessary to uh, persuade China that it's a, it would be a good thing to do. The big unfettered access to our market. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I, I think the crucial thing is one of timing. You're right that, that China and India would be upset if there's a border measure in the bill you would adopt. But none of the bills on the table now would impose that border measure as of the beginning. It would be phased in after five or ten years even. And that's exactly what Europe is also considering. Um, let me slip in another question since my time is about to run out. I haven't heard, and I apologize if I've just missed them because of other things I've had to do, but I haven't heard a lot of estimates about job loss, uh, even under the proposals, uh, Mr. McMacken, that you point out. Give me some comparisons, if you will, about potential job loss if we did what I suppose our colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to do, uh, 
uh, which was virtually nothing in terms of cap and trade. I guess you've got three scenarios, doing nothing, status quo. Uh, if we were to have a very aggressive cap and trade regime of the kind that frankly some of the Democratic caucus would advocate, and if we were to have a cap and trade regime that has the kinds of allowances for leakage that you and Mr. Gerard talk about, can you compare the last two in terms of potential job loss? Just very quickly, the, uh, uh, Mr. Morgenstern of Resources for the Future testified last week in Energy and Commerce that he thought the job loss, the leakage, could be as much as 40 percent for the most exposed industries over the, uh, over the long term. I guess the thrust of our, my group's pr uh, provision is if we negate or at least substantially mitigate the cost that would cause that job lease, uh, that job loss, we could essentially save all of that leakage. Mr. Gerard, do you have any follow-up to that? <coughs> the only thing I would add to that is supporting his argument and combining that with the President's position on creating renewable energy sector, we could end up, end up being job positive. If I could get one final indulgence, does anyone in the committee dispute the numbers about 40 percent job losses for the most leveraged industries under leakage? Yeah, th this is actually the cement industry which my firm has been representing and it, it's, I think as, as Chairman Levin was saying, you need to look industry for industry and the, the numbers are very different. So it, it means you have to have a ladder, you have to have a combination and take this very seriously. There's no silver bullet here. All right. I think, Mr. Davis, your, your questions have been so cogent. It's, it's really uh, important that you were able to, to be with us and Thank to you. stay. This is the practice. All the members of the committee are going to be welcome by both Republicans and Democrats to all of these hearings. So. Uh, our caucus chair, you, you get the last crack at this, and thank you for finding the time to join us. Well, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank the fellow uh, members on the uh, subcommittee. Um, uh, this has been an extraordinary panel, and I want to thank them for their participation uh, as well. Um, it seems to me uh, uh, that uh, the science is pretty clear. And it seems to me that all the panelists uh, acknowledge uh, that we have an environmental problem that we face. And depending upon who you listen to, whether or not we're going to reach a tipping point that will be catastrophic. And that's everyone from scientists to our own military leaders. That's not what this hearing is about. I am pleased that, the, that this hearing is focused on something that I think everyone can agree on. Is there anyone on the panel who doesn't believe uh, that a solution and um, uh, my colleague from Alabama, I think, articulated it very well. We're either going with a, some form of cap and trade system, some form of carbon tax, or uh, we're doing nothing. But in all three cases, you're talking about taxes. If we do nothing, we're talking about the situation that we're currently in that is volatile, as we've seen just this past year, we, where we subject subject ourselves to once again paying the taxes and seeing the dollars flow overseas to Saudi Arabia, to the OPEC cartel, to re-emergent Russia, and even to our neighbor in Canada or Venezuela. We are going to be paying taxes, higher taxes, one way or the other. Is there anyone on the panel that, that would disagree that this issue if we're to combat it forthrightly and level with the American people, that this doesn't concern taxation. Thank you. I, you know, and I think a lot of my, uh, I think my, some of my colleagues on the other side, they recognize that this is a tax, but they, you know, that's a, that's a terrible word in, in governing. And so nobody likes to say it, and because it ha carries with it incredible consequences. So the question becomes, in facing global catastrophe and leveling with the American people whether or not the Congress of the United States is going to have the temerity to say up front, yes, what we're dealing with is a tax, but here's what we're going to do in terms of making sure from an import-export position, in terms of impacted industries like Mr. Clay's, but also coal miners uh, throughout this country steel workers, that we're going to provide by recognizing uh, that we're going to tax polluters up front and then pass on 
the savings, pass on those taxes in a revenue neutral manner to those industries, those individuals, and those communities that are impacted so that we can both combat climate change and global warming, but also the need for energy independence by making the kind of investments that both preserve the environment and provide us an opportunity to make sure we're safeguarding our workforce, in fact, enhancing their opportunity to perform. I think it's a matter of leveling with the American people and getting beyond the nonsense. This is about taxing, and this is going to be about stepping up to the plate. Call it cap and trade, call it a carbon tax, call it we're going to pretend we're going to do nothing, but we're just going to watch the taxes go up automatically because of what we're going to have to pay in terms of what we're currently paying now to other nations because we don't have a <coughs> plan that can engage the country in a meaningful and significant way. And so uh, I would ask uh, whether or not the panelists feel that a marketplace solution or a direct governmental solution in terms of tax and passing that on is a better way to go. I uh, <coughs> have to admit that in the last six or eight months I've become very, very apprehensive of the term market-based solutions. Uh, that uh, when we see what's happened in the so-called market. Let me, let me say that from the point of view of our union, and, and as, as both uh, citizens and representatives, uh, I think it's very important that we don't damage uh, energy-intensive industries or export-intensive industries as we work our way through this problem. And I actually believe that if we do the costing of carbon right, and we take the right steps to make sure it doesn't uh, do damage to our own industries, combined with uh, the President's campaign on renewable energy, I absolutely believe that over the next 5, 8, 10, 12, 20 years, we can be job positive, and we need transition programs, and we need to make absolutely sure, I'll take two industries that we represent, that the, the majority of the people in those industries, cement and steel. There currently is no scientific way to make cement or steel without creating carbon because of the, the process of making it. If we don't protect those industries, we'll always need steel and cement. And if we're getting it from China or some other place that doesn't have the same kind of standards we do, we'll end up putting more nails in our manufacturing coffin and making ourselves just as reliable, or just as reliant, I should say, on those governments as we are now on Middle East soil. And so I think it's a very, very important process that you've engaged in and that the chairman's engaged in and that we're engaged in, in finding a way to cost carbon that doesn't uh, create a domestic disadvantage for our producers, yet at the same time marrying that to the administration's effort to create renewable energy. If we do that, we'll be way ahead of the game, and I applaud you for the work you've done. Just very quickly, I, I do see a sorry. Oh, sorry, I do see a big difference though. Taxes and debt are certain, but paying the price for carbon is not a necessity. The whole idea is that if you price carbon, people will move away into greener energy, creating green jobs. So you can actually avoid the tax, and you can cr create green jobs without the government having to spend money. Going back to an earlier question, but yes, it, it imposes a cost, but you can avoid it by shifting, producing. Do you seriously way. believe that the companies that you impose the tax on are not going to pass those on to the consumer? A again, that will depend industry by industry. That's what I'm talking about, leveling with the people. They want the truth from their elected representatives about what will happen, notwithstanding that that would ever happen in the marketplace, that they would pass a cost along ultimately to the, to the consumer. <coughs> <coughs> All right. Um, this is so interesting we could go on, but Hours. And, and, and I, I won't say thank you, it's our job. Uh, we, we've been here for a number of hours, a most illuminating hearing. There will be more, and thank you to all of you who came here to testify and be here throughout. We now stand, I'll say adjourned, though it's really recess, because we'll be back at this subject. And thank you, Mr. Mr. Brady. Thank you.